at let's just let me just let me just preface this whole video here we're gonna be watching jordan peterson's video that he did with pierre polyev it's titled canada's biggest problems canada's uh canadian pm candidate pierre polyev the title the the thumbnail says housing inflation and socialism now i just want to see how this how this goes i don't know if we're actually going to go all the way through this this is like an hour and a half long video um but i do want to watch at least a little bit of this on stream and record it because i want to have my live reaction to this because i imagine i'm going to lose my shit at both of these absolute clowns so let's go ahead and watch this let's watch and see what happens um and yeah i i mean it's 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 jordan peterson like come on like <laughs> all right let's go ahead and get into this let's watch it <clears throat> canada at the moment what are our problems well the, the the central underlying illness is a monstrous growth in the power and cost of the state at the expense of the agency and freedom of the people i'm here simply restoring what can already belong to canadians um by virtue of their 800 year inheritance of english liberties going back to the magna carta i'm uh, just among the the common people who are custodians of that freedom while we're alive you know, edmund burke said it's a contract between the dead the living and the yet to be born and we're the, the living generation has the duty to pass on that inheritance and that's what I, I see myself doing is to, to rekindle that inheritance and pass it on to my kids and so they can pass it on to their kids. And We're already into determinism and passing things on to future generations while preserving traditions of the old. Hmm. Curious. And uh, I'll pass away into the, uh, fade away into the, the past one. Can you fade away now, Pierre? Thanks. Someday, but hopefully we'll have secured the freedom that we inherited for many more generations to come. And that's, that's what I mean when I want to give people back control of their life in the present. It's also um, to extend it into the future. So that's... This guy is uh, pretty much against anything climate related, but he wants to preserve the future. Okay, sure, bud. Purpose. That's why I'm running. I, you know, People want to support me. My, Pierre for pm.ca um, is that's Pierre for the number four pm.ca is how you can sign up, become a member and do that. I also love how he's talking about he's running for prime minister, but he's not. He's running for the conservative leadership and the conservatives are probably not going to win the, the a, a general election anytime soon. Like. Do. Do they have the, a chance with Pierre as their leader? Yeah, I actually think they do. That's, 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 that is a little bit scary. But I also think that you're not running for a prime minister, bro. Like, <laughs> and I would be honored to have people support in this enterprise. At least not right now. Like you're running to be the candidate of, uh, you're, you're running to be the leader of the conservative party and there's not planned to be an election for three more years. So Saying that this is, uh, he's saying he's a prime minister, ministerial candidate is just stupid. Okay, nope, we're skipping this. Polyev, he is the current front runner in the race for leadership of the Federal Conservative Party of Canada, and he is therefore a likely candidate for prime minister of Canada within the foreseeable future, within the next few years. The conservatives in Canada have served historically alternatively to lead Canada, competing with the Liberals primarily at the federal or national and provincial or state level, although the Liberals, their primary opponents, have been more historically successful as they've served more terms. Mr. Polyev served as a senior cabinet minister in Prime Minister Stephen Harper's conservative government prior to the recent what is he election doing? of Justin Trudeau <clears throat> and the Liberals <clears throat> and has served as a member of parliament. <laughs> For seven terms, and with that brief outsider, by the way, seven term, seven term uh, member of parliament, outsider, by the way. Introduction. I'm going to served as a served as a cabinet minister, outsider, by the way. Turn the discussion over to Mr. Polyev, who can 
fill us in on a little biographical information so we know who he is, and then we'll turn to more specific issues. Oh, we need to know who he is now, too. To talk to me today, and welcome. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Peterson. Great to be with you. Dr. Peterson, oh. So we'll do Jordan and Pierre. How is that? That's fine by me. All right, away we go. So let's let's start. Who are you? Who are you? Where'd you come from? And how do you get interested in politics? And why are you the man for the job here? Thank you. Well, like you, I'm from Alberta, although further south. I come from Calgary. And um, I'm from Calgary. My are from Saskatchewan. <laughs> uh, they married in 77, moved to Calgary, where they adopted me. I was uh, born of a 16 year old unwed mother whose mother had just died. And so she was in no position to raise a child. So she put me up for adoption and I was blessed to be adopted by Marlene and Don Polyev, two teachers from Saskatchewan and a pretty normal upbringing. I uh, grew up in the eighties and like I was born in 79. So I, my early childhood was in the eighties. Uh, it was kind of a brutal time to be uh, a homeowner or a family because there was these monstrous interest rates. So some of my early, earliest memories as a child were the financial stress that my folks were going through. Uh, and a lot of people were losing their homes and uh, their lives. How did this man end up being a conservative? That's my question. You grew up with two teachers as parents. You grew up around financial insecurity and yet you end up as a conservative like how the fuck does that happen livelihoods at that time uh and uh wait he got into banking didn't he let's find out i think that made an early impression on my thinking uh, even though at the time i didn't really understand what was happening or why i was able to, later on to look back at that strain and stress and then try to diagnose it uh when i i, I was old enough to understand um and um and that kind of for, formulated some of my political ideologies. Uh, we can return to that later on. But I, you know, I grew up uh, middle class, couple of uh, teachers who got divorced when I was in my mid teens, and uh, sort of bounced back and forth between mom and dad's place throughout my teenage years. Went to University of Calgary. Yeah, so we do have a fair bit in common because my one yeah. of my parents, my. Okay, so yeah, cool. I'm, is a teacher. They're both this is parents. not. This is yeah, this is boring as shit. To Alberta, same lots of people from Saskatchewan did. I got interested in politics at an early age. I remember that period of inflation because, well, well, I my te my parent, my father, and maybe your parents. My father pensions when the banks collapsed. The teacher because the teachers did. Mine didn't lose their pensions. We did have to move. Um, because I, I think in retrospect, that was because of the interest rate hikes. We, I, I'm, I'm guessing that my folks were not able to pay the mortgage at the higher rates. Um, and then uh, we had to move to a smaller place and uh, we had to sell our car and get us get a down downgrade our uh, automobile and all of the above just to kind of keep a man who in 2022 uses the word automobile should never be trusted for the record. Keep our heads above water. And that would have been, I'm guessing, around sort of 83, 84. Um, and that was a really... Dude, you were five. How the fuck do you remember any of this shit? Really kind of hellish time, particularly in... <laughs> I don't remember shit from when I was five, other than, like, memories that were told to me. I don't remember that shit. You don't, like... The only, like, like picture memory I have in my head of, like, that time was... One, uh, when we moved to California from BC, uh, we drove this little red Hyundai down and it didn't have AC and it was in the middle of summer in California and it was hot as shit. And I remember looking out the window and just seeing like steam coming up from like the, uh, coming up from like the, 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 the dunes out in the, out in the distance. Like you could see like the, like the heat, heat, uh, heat gaze. It was, I remember that. That's like all I remember about that. In Alberta, because the central government had unleashed a wicked assault on the energy sector. Also, the way he, the way he uses words, central government, attacks, these are very explicit rhetorical choices. We don't have a central government. We have a federal government. 
there wasn't an attack on the oil and gas industry at least not in the 80s and 90s that was up in that was like 2015 if you really want to call the in an attack on oil and gas that would have been 2015 so talking about the 80s and 90s as the the good old days is a little bit sus called the national energy program uh, and simultaneously the worst of the trudeau socialist years were coming to bear on the entire national economy so you had 12 percent inflation 12 percent unemployment 20 socialist yeah okay dude four percent mortgage man's a liberal and he's like the socialists rates that's real fun for everyone yes and um highest misery index in canadian history that's unemployment plus inflation and that was under justin's father yes surprise surprise yes and here we are with the same policies leading to the same results just as the dog returns to its vomit and the sow returns to its mire the burn fool's bandaged finger goes wobbling back to the fire as kipling would write um but um what a weirdo uh, it was a miserable time for a lot of people now I was blessed because my folks were teachers, so they ultimately didn't lose their livelihoods. Um, and, uh, you know, we were able to, we had a modest upbringing, but I would never have called myself poor. Okay, can we get to something more interesting? I really don't give a shit about your background or why this, why you're doing this. All right. Ooh, left-wing ideas and socialism. Let's go ahead and watch this little section. Market system. Um, Hold on. Book. I... You know, I didn't agree with 100% of what he wrote. I still don't. However, the fundamental logic of the free market system um, to me is inescapable. Okay, what is that logic as far as you're concerned? Why is it that? Is, why, why is it inescapable? Because he's going to give us some capitalist realist uh, talking points and then go, well, it's the way it always is and it's the way it's always going to be. In a free and open market, you can't oh, and freedom unless you make someone else better off. So I that's what? No, what? No, that's not how that works at all. What? No, say that again. Say that again. In an open market, you can't get ahead unless you make someone else better off. In a free and open market, you can't get ahead unless you make somebody else better off. Are you fucking high? No, that's 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 the entire opposite point. You can't get ahead unless if you make somebody else worse. Now, you can argue in favor of that position, saying that I have, the, I have the mental or technical skills that I have the ability to produce something, and I need workers underneath me who don't have those skills to help support this industry. I give them a job, they give, and I give them money, but I keep the profits. That's like the best, least cringe version of this. But you can't just go out and say... You can't get ahead unless you make other people better because that's not how this works. So I We just talked about Maple Leaf. They're they're fucking uh price cartelling their meat products while saying that they need to have a a better way to uh solve food insecurity while they're just worried about shareholder profits. You can't you you can't do both. You have to pick one. And the fact that he th thinks that you can do that or at least says that out loud so that people hear that is absolutely fucking insane use the old um apple orange eye analogy if you have an apple and one an orange and i have an orange and one an apple and we trade we're both better off even though we still have an apple and orange between us yes but we're not trading fungible good we're not trading non-fungible goods like that in this day and age we're not i'm not going to a market and trading my potatoes for your grapes I'm selling my potatoes, getting cash for it, and then I'm going to you and giving you cash for your grapes. And if there is an employee in between me selling my potatoes and getting that money, I'm going to take excess profit away from my employee because they did work as well. I'm, if I do all of the actions, if I go out and sell those potatoes myself, I get all that money and then I go buy the grapes. Okay, then there's no excess profit. There's no exploitation there. But as soon as I hire somebody to go sell those potatoes for me and I don't give them the, equal, the, the, the proper amount that their time was spent and their effort, then it's, it's exploitative. You can't, like, there's, somebody loses in this situation. Um, it's like... Which is why when I was talking about Maple Leaf, it was about, okay, yeah, all their, most of their positions are unionized, most of their workers have a living wage, and most of their workers have... 
you know, better than average salaries. But they're still being exploited regardless because there's still shareholder profits and dividends which are going out, which is not going to the employees of the company. Therefore, directly affecting income inequality that Mr. McCain is so worried about. You can't be on both sides of this. This is a classic conservative point. Liberals at least generally understand that there's no profit without labor, whereas these guys are saying there's no, there's no, there's no excess, there's no exploitation with labor. What? When you go to a coffee shop and you buy a coffee, you say thank you uh, to the lady who gave it to you. Thank you. She says not. You're welcome. But she says thank you back. Uh, now, why is that? Well, the answer is because each of you has something, has, has gained something more valuable than you had before. Uh, you have the cup of coffee that's worth more than the two fifty you paid for it. Not true. The coffee shop has the two fifty. And why do you think they're? And the employee there gets forty cents of that two fifty that they just produced all the profits on. They probably don't even get that much because they're splitting that with like six other employees in the shop. Which is why Starbucks is unionizing. So go ahead and unionize your Starbucks if you can. Tim should be next. The free part of that is important. So that's the trade part. Why is the free part important? Because that's the only way to guarantee both people, both sides believe they're better off, right? <laughs> <laughs> Why is the free part so important? Because then that's the only way for people to believe that both sides are better off. Both sides aren't better off, Pierre. And you know that. Jordan knows that. Everybody knows that. But it's the belief that both sides are better off. What the fuck is wrong with you? Jesus Christ, this is retarded. Because in, in the form of in taxation, government forcefully uh, imposes a transaction. It is considered to be a transaction, tax taxes, right? You're paying for a whole... Oh, now we're getting into taxation as theft? Huh, cool. ...whole plethora of services. But you didn't choose it. No, you choose to live in this country, and if you choose to live in this country, you have to choose to pay for taxes. And if you choose to live in this country and you choose to pay taxes, then you're, then you're, then you're able to be served by those taxes. If you do not want to pay taxes in this country, MOVE! It's not that fucking hard. So even if you've decided that the cost of your tax bill is not worth the benefit of the government services, you have to pay it anyway. Whereas back to the coffee shop, you have to, if you don't believe the coffee is worth more than the money, you won't pay it. And if they don't believe the money is worth more than the coffee, they won't, they won't sell it. Which is how we get to inflation. Dun, da, 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 da. Um, so the only way in a market system to make yourself better off is to make someone else sign. Oh my God. No, the only way to make yourself better off is to make more profit. That's the only reason the free market exists is to make profit. It has nothing to do with freedom. Simultaneous. So stop, stop giving out these bullshit claims and bullshit arguments. They're, they're bullshit. You don't even believe it yourself. Better off. So why did you now look, lots of young people, even Jordan's confused. He's like, well, uh, I mean, those, those postmodern neo-Marxists, but Pierre. And that today, either are not exposed to the ideas that you just put forward, or they don't find them persuasive, say, in contrast to what appears on the surface to be the more compassionate left-wing view that's characterized frequently, and sometimes realistically, you know, by concern for the working class. Like, I worked for the NDP when I was a kid, and at that time in Alberta, Grant Notley ran the NDP, and he was an old union guy in some fundamental sense, and so were most of the people he associated with, you know, and they, they did have a real concern for the working class, at least some of them did, and I would say that was particularly true of the leadership, not so much the activists. But, you know, you were pretty young when you came across Friedman. I didn't have that uh, experience when I was, say, the same age as you. Why did you find that persuasive? In contrast to the left-wing ideas, this, the ideas of socialism, this rooted in this hypothetical compassion that seems so attractive to kids today. Kids today only want to be compassionate. They don't want to care only about the profit motive. I'm an old man and I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about either. All right, we're not going to make it through this whole hour and a half, but 
I, I I can't. This is this is this is brain rot. Um, we'll watch like another. We'll we'll finish this section because I didn't see the compassion playing itself in any out in any uh, real way. It was uh, it's a it's a catchphrase. Um, but I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about socialism equals compassion. I don't. I don't. I don't. Maybe that's a thing that people say somewhere. Um, what is God, what we're actually debating is not who's more compassionate. There's no evidence that people on the socialist left are especially generous with their own money. Sure, they like to spend other people's money. Define other people's money, Pierre. That's right, taxes. And you live in Canada, right? Therefore, you pay taxes in Canada, right? Cool. Pay your fucking taxes and shut the fuck up. But what you see uh, is really uh, with socialism is uh, an Animal House playing itself out over. And over. <laughs> uh, you know when the uh, Animal Farm, excuse me, Animal Farm playing itself over. That's and over a again. definite difference. Um, and, uh, yeah, de definite difference. Animal Farm. Uh, you know the pigs didn't say they wanted to take the house so that they could be more comfortable and spoiled. Uh, they said they were doing it to make everyone equal and to remove the oppression. But then when, the, uh, when they actually took the house, they basically they became the new masters and served themselves. And that's what, you, that's what actually happens in socialism. It doesn't eliminate hierarchy. So why did, you, why did you buy that argument? That's why you should be an anarchist, not a straight socialist. Hierarchies are always unjust, unless if you can prove that they're justified. And I think you can pretty easily prove that taxes are a justifiable hierarchy of a system that needs currency to survive in its current state. So this is just a this is just right wing retards talking circles around each other that they don't even understand each other because their ideas are so incomprehensible that they don't even make sense to each other. That's that's the level that we've gotten to. And the like slightly fash wording that rhetoric that Pierre's been using doesn't seem to give us very much um, hope that he's gonna do anything in do anything that would actually help anybody. And as he just said, that's not his main concern. His main concern is not helping people. It's to enforce free market principles from a Friedman perspective, which is generally seen as pretty libertarian, pretty free market, and deregulation, deunionization, et cetera, et privatization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Top trickle-down economics, which has failed over and over and over and over and over again, and yet we have the same fucking people in that same mindset of Harper, of Reagan, of Thatcher... Just continually talking up these same fucking points over and over again, expecting a different result. That's the definition of insanity, Pierre. And you're fucking insane. Hey, thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell if you want to catch my next live stream that this video came from. Until tomorrow, everybody, have a fantastic day, y'all.